I spent 13 hours in the Magic Kingdom on October 1st to celebrate Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary. Today, I am recapping my full experience on the show. What up, Opinioneers? Welcome to episode 118 of the WDW Opinion Podcast. My name is Connor Brown. I'm a former cast member, author, blogger, travel agent, and a Walt Disney World expert. And I am helping you plan for and daydream about your next perfect Walt Disney World vacation. If you are a new listener here, welcome to the show. Feel free to go back and check out all of our old podcast episodes covering a wide variety of Disney-related topics. And you can subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. If you're a longtime listener, welcome back. Thanks for being here. If you continue to enjoy the show, please consider sharing it with a friend you think might enjoy it as well. If you're watching the show on YouTube, thanks for tuning in. I know I am not on camera for this episode. That's because I'm currently staying with a friend and with travel and the 50th. I just didn't have enough time to set up a camera-ready space. Um, I'm actually staying at my friend's house that used to be his grandma's house, so there's a lot of great grandma content in here. Not content, but tchotchkes. Um... And I think if I would be on camera, it would just look really, really, really creepy. Um, I'm looking at a Sleepless in Seattle VHS tape. Uh, Someone like you, VHS. You've got mail, VHS. Something's got to give. A lot of VHS tapes. A lot of VHS tapes. Um, A lot of weird stuff. So that's why I'm not on camera. But... If you're still watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the like button on the video, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. And if you do ever want to check out the video version of the show, past shows, and any other videos we have, head over to youtube.com slash WDWOpinion to check it out. If you haven't heard, we have a new offer from WDW Opinion, a new weekly show called News to Opinion. Every Thursday, we come out with that show where I cover the latest Disney Parks news stories and then share my thoughts and opinions on them. It's a lot of fun, super informative. If you haven't checked that out yet, you can find it in this podcast feed or on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe to this feed right now so that you can get the next episode, which is coming out this Thursday as well. And there was a ton of announcements made um, about new things coming to the parks, uh, uh, Later this year, uh, uh, actually, mostly next year in 2022, those announcements were just made. We're going to be talking about them on this week's News to Opinion, so be sure to subscribe to this feed so that you can stay up to date with all of that. Now, while the Walt Disney Corporation has said that Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary, the most magical celebration on Earth is going to last for 18 months, I knew that even though the celebration would be happening for for so long, for that long, I knew I just had to be in the park on the actual 50th anniversary of October 1st. And I'm so glad that I did choose to do that because it ended up being one of my favorite park days of all time. Sure, it was crazy, but it really was crazy fun. And here's my recap of that very special day. Before we start with the day itself, I think it's important to go back a little bit and talk about me getting to the 50th anniversary. Meaning, like me actually making plans for the 50th. In my heart, I always knew I had to be in Walt Disney World for the 50th, and I had to be in Magic Kingdom for the 50th. 
October 1st, 1971 was the first day Walt Disney World and Magic Kingdom were open to the public. Even though I was born, you know, decades later, that day of October 1st, 1971, that day changed my life. Disney World, it's always been a very, very special place for me. As you can probably tell since I've started this podcast and this business around Walt Disney World. Growing up, I took countless vacations to Walt Disney World, and I always hated leaving. I remember, like, even in high school, we would get back home from a trip. We would get back home to Maryland. I would go up to my room, and I remember I would just have these, these like, panic attacks, like, shortness of breath, like, freaking out. And, and they were all, like, they all revolved around... I don't know when I'm going to go back. I, I I don't know how I'll be able to survive. Why did we leave? Why did we leave? And I would just get filled with this anxiety. And I would like even, I would start to cry. Which as a high school boy was probably the lamest possible thing I could do. Crying over leaving Walt Disney World. But it would happen to me. And I don't know why. But I think that that just explains how how much this place has has impacted me so much. I don't know you know, why I would get those panic attacks or those anxiety attacks. But for whatever reason, Walt Disney World has had this profound impact on my being. I know that my love for this place has it's brought me so many incredible memories. It drove me to become a Disney cast member. It drove me to start this podcast and business. And it's brought me so many incredible friends from the Disney community. Uh, people like you, that I'm so grateful to have in my life. Walt Disney World has has given me so much. Sir, sure, I've given them plenty, plenty of my money and my time and my energy and working there and all that, but I think that that it's given me so much more, so much more. That's all just to say I felt I owed it to myself to be there on the 50th. But it's funny because I really didn't have concrete plans until uh, like a few weeks ago. There was just a lot going on uh, in my personal life, uh, my professional life. So I kind of dropped the ball when it came to, to making these plans. And in fact, initially I got shut out for park passes. Magic Kingdom and my backup of Epcot, they're all booked. Which is funny because I was booking trips for my clients through my travel agent services. I was booking trips for them for October 1st, but I wasn't thinking of my own plans. Um, I guess that just means I always put the client first. Email me, Connor, C-O-N-O-R, W-D-W opinion dot com. We'll get you to Walt Disney World. Um, shameless plug. Eventually, you know, I took a step back and said... I need to come up with a plan. Disney, thank goodness, they ended up releasing more Park Pass reservations for Magic Kingdom. Once I got that news, I jumped on the computer, snatched one, got one for Magic Kingdom on October 1st. And then my mom and I scheduled a trip for the days leading up to the 50th. If you followed my Instagram, at WDW Opinion, you probably saw our trip where we went all throughout the parks and Disney Springs and everything in between. Um, It was a lot of fun. We planned that trip, but my mom was going to leave a day before October 1st, um, so on the 30th of September. I was going to go stay with my friend after my mom left, and then I was going to go to Magic Kingdom on October 1st that day. And the plan was great. I thought it, it, it made perfect sense. And as the days approached, people kept asking me, okay, you're going to the park, right? But but what's your plan for the day? What are you going to do in the park that day? What are your goals? And that got me thinking. And what I realized was I had no goals. There were no absolute must-dos. Shout out Stacy, Stacy. The Disney must-dos. There were no Disney must-dos for my day. All I wanted was to be there in the park with tens of thousands of other Disney fans and just be a part of that special day. As long as I could do that, as long as I could be there, 
then that day would be a success. I wasn't going to measure this day by the amount of tractions I did, or the amount of merch I bought, or the amount of interesting new food items that I, I tried. No. My success was having two feet planted on Main Street for any period of time during the 50th anniversary. That was going to be the success that I had. I didn't know how long I was going to stay in the park or what the schedule was going to be like, but I knew as long as I was in that atmosphere, then I was a o k. But I did need a plan for how I was going to get into the park. Like, I mean, how I was going to get there, uh, what time I was going to arrive, all that jazz. The official park opening for October 1st was 8 a.m. that day. But now, hotel guests at a Disney-owned and operated resort hotel, they can get into, um, every day they can get into every single park uh, 30 minutes before it opens. So they get a 30-minute head start on the day guests, the people that are not staying at a Disney-owned and operated hotel. So I knew that 30 minutes beforehand, resort guests can start experience attractions. So I knew that at 7.30 a.m., people would be in the park. Now, typically, people are always allowed in before then. So it's like rope drop, you know, park opens at 8. They let people in at 7.30. You get up to the rope on the lands around the hub. 8 o'clock happens, ropes drop, you go to your attractions. I knew that that because of this, because of this early morning magic hours, whatever they're calling it now, happening at 7.30, that people were going to be let into the park much earlier than that. But for this day, the question was, how earlier will they be let in? Magic Kingdom was sold out of Park Pass Reservations. They opened it up a couple other times and sold out subsequently every single time. So the park was probably at whatever capacity Disney has created for this moment in time. But when would they be let in? When would people start be letting in? Not when they could start experiencing attractions. When could you scan your ticket and go into the park? I had done some research. I talked with some friends. And rumors were circulating that the Magic Kingdom Auto Plaza, where you pull up and pay for parking or show your annual pass to get in for parking, the rumors were saying that they were going to start letting cars in at like 4.30 in the morning. I was driving. I had my car. It's about a 30-minute drive from where I am to get to Magic Kingdom. Now, I love Disney, as I've stated. High school Connor crying in bedroom because he couldn't go to Walt Disney World. I love Disney. I don't know if I love it at 4.30 in the morning. My concern, though, was what if we have this plan at 4.30 in the morning, we drive there, and uh, they don't open the auto plaza then, and Disney starts turning cars away. If that occurred, then I would have to turn around, and I would basically just, I would have no place to go. That's what I was worried about. I was worried about them turning people away. So I figured, you know what, they're definitely going to be opening up everything earlier uh, than normal just because they were expecting large crowds, just because it was a super important day, a lot going on. So I decided I was just going to try and get there an hour before the park opens and then just go from there. Um, if I missed some special opening presentation, whatever, I just wanted to get in the park. I was expecting long lines, super long lines everywhere, but I really didn't experience that. I got to the Magic Kingdom Auto Plaza at 6.54. There were only three cars in front of me, so that took about a minute to get through that line. I parked. There were no lines at security. I walked right through. There was no line at Joffrey's at the Ticketing and Transportation Center, uh, so I got a Joffrey's coffee right there. I got on the ferry boat. The ferry boat was quite empty. Sat on the ferry boat for about five minutes. Then it started to take off. And um, I love taking the ferry boat. I love coming in over the water. I love seeing the castle get closer and closer to you. And I think that this was the perfect, perfect way to start um, the day. Mainly because uh, it was early. 
which was great. But then at the same time, the sun was rising. And I think seeing the sun rise over Seven Seas Lagoon, being on the ferry, making my way towards Magic Kingdom, everyone started to feel really excited on that boat. That was just such a great tone setter for the rest of the day. Seeing the sun come up, I knew it was going to be a long day, but I knew it was going to be a really, really, really great day. Get off the boat. No wait at the turnstiles. I walked right in after I scanned my pass. I was in the park by 7.20. So basically 20 minutes after I pulled into the Magic Kingdom parking lot, I was in the park itself. I think that that, that was incredible. I was I was expecting super long lines everywhere. I was expecting waiting hours to get into this park. Um, kind of like you see on at uh, Christmas or New Year's or Fourth of July, just super long lines everywhere. I think the reasoning for no lines was that Disney did end up opening everything up super early. So I think they were able to get a ton of people in at the earliest times possible, which made the time when I showed up a breeze. I think for the people that showed up at 5 a.m., they had long lines. But since I showed up later, I pretty much missed that big crowd. I do know that the buses at many of the resorts were super backed up. I saw a picture from the Pop Century, and it looked like a nightmare. I knew there was some chaos involved with that. Um, and even though I didn't experience long lines, when I got into the park, Main Street and the Hub were packed. It was like a fireworks show on the 4th of July was about to happen. There was just so many people in there. And it was so odd because it was 7.20 in the morning. And I think a lot of people did get up early. I know when the park closed the day before, people exited the park and then walked to the turnstiles and like sat down and uh, like waiting uh, for the next day for the park to open. Um, so they like walked out at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock that night uh exited, turned around, and then sat in front of the turnstiles, and security was like, yeah, you guys got to get out of here. Um, I saw lines of people uh, who were staying at the Contemporary. You know, they were out there super early at like four in the morning, crazy stuff like that. Um, I thank God that I, you know, got up at a still an ungodly hour of like 5 a.m., um, but that I was able to kind of miss those those big crowds, which was great. And when you get on Main Street and you start seeing the sea of humanity, you realize that everyone was in a line. Lines were crazy for the Emporium because there was a lot of, you know, day-specific merchandise. And lines were crazy for PhotoPass photographers. PhotoPass was free for everyone in the park that day. It was like Disney giving everyone a 50th uh, anniversary gift. Um, so there were lines for all of those things everywhere. But I think a really important aspect for me and why I was able to find so much success in showing up when I showed up was I was just by myself at this time. So it was easy in that I only had to look out for myself. I didn't have to make sure everyone was still behind me. I only had to look for, you know, a spot for one person to fit. I didn't have to look for a spot of, you know, we got to fit five people there. No, I think because it was just me, because I just had to look for a spot for one person. That's how I was able to get all the way up to the hub. And I knew I wanted to get close to the castle. So I was positioned with the partner statue a little to the right of me. I was on the sidewalk just before you step down onto the street, kind of like at the bend in the circle, uh, uh, like the roundabout circle that is the hub. I was there for a little while, and basically what was going on was that they had the rest of the hub in front of us roped off. Resort hotel guests were able to get in that section at 7.30 by scanning their magic band or room key. They could then go into the lands and ride select attractions, all that stuff. But they had us behind that rope. Around like 7.45 though, they dropped that rope and the whole group of people around me and in front of me, we just all moved forward. I got to about, when you're looking at the castle in front of it, there's the wall that's kind of at the base of it. It's shaped like a U in front of the castle. It's always the uh, place where 
people, you know, take the picture of them jumping in the air and they try to get, uh, you know, a pic of them off the feet, uh, uh, in the air, jumping in the air. I was right at like where the entrance to the castle ramp is. So that was just adjacent to me. I could almost basically touch it. And then Liberty Square was on my left. So I was, I was really close to the uh, uh, front of the castle, to the castle stage, um, all that. For someone who got there at 7.20, I was very close to the front from what I was expecting. At 7.55, the castle welcome show started. This is called Let the Magic Begin. And the cool thing about this is it hadn't run since the parks closed for the pandemic. October 1st was the first time it had run since middle of March 2020. So bringing it back on this day was pretty awesome. It was pretty similar to what it used to be. Mickey and Minnie come out, they welcome you, and then they bring out some of their other friends from around the kingdom to say, welcome to Magic Kingdom, have a great day. The only real difference that I caught was there's a comment in the show now about how they're all wearing their new iridescent outfits and iridescent this is this is the new color that disney created uh it's shimmery it's purple um i'm probably not doing it too good of justice describing it like this Uh, but this is the color that is celebrating the 50th anniversary uh what disney you know came up with and this stuff is everywhere i mean it's on character clothes It's on balloons, like the balloons look a little sparkly. It's in food and drinks. It's on merch and clothing you can buy. buy. It's on the castle, on cavalcade floats. It's like, um, it's everywhere. And it, it reminds me of, you know in my big fat Greek wedding, the dad who thinks he can fix everything by spraying Windex on it? That's a lot what this is. It's like, what are we gonna do to celebrate? Here's a new color. Let's put it on everything. Everything? Everything. Or the girl, the college girl. Everyone knows this this girl. The girl in college who asks for a side of ranch with everything she eats. She's like, this, these chicken fingers are good, but you know what would make them better? Side of ranch. This castle's great, but you know what would make it better? An iridescent shimmer to it. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. We're going to have to live with this for the next 18 months, and I am going to get so sick and tired of it. But on the 50th, I was happy to indulge Mickey and Minnie on their sparkly new costumes. Let the magic begin. It was great. There was no real special announcement. I think a lot of people were were thinking, you know, there was going to be a presentation. There was going to be, um, I don't know, some acknowledgement of the 50th anniversary, uh, There was no real special announcement. The night before, they had Bob Chapek, CEO of the company, Bob Iger, chairman of the board. Um, They came out uh, of Magic Kingdom Castle, and they did a rededication. That all took place the night before, during a media event. And that media event was also streamed online, and it was the one that featured uh, a stream of Enchantment, the new fireworks show. So they did all that the night before. I think there was a couple of reasons for that. Um, one was it, it was just less chaotic. They could have higher production value. They knew they were going to have super high crowds. So getting cameras in there and all that stuff, audio setup was going to be a challenge. But my theory, and I think the theory that a lot of other people have, is they did it the night before because the people that were in the park that night were cast members, were media people, and other select few. Um I think they did it the night before because I believe Disney thinks if they put Chapek up there, Bob Chapek, CEO of the company, if they put him up there on October 1st of 2021 at 8 a.m. in front of the Magic Kingdom, if they put him up there, I believe uh, people would boo him. Uh, a lot of, mainly it was hardcore Disney fans that were there that day. A lot of people do not like him, do not like Mr. Chapek. I think a lot of people would have booed, which, you know, you can boo, you can not boo, whatever. I think um, that probably wouldn't have been a great way to start the 50th anniversary. Um, So Disney made that decision. There was nothing too special 
about that opening show. No real special announcements, like I said. But what was cool was you were just in this sea of people. And the vast majority of these people were were Disney pros. This trip was made for that exact reason. There were so many people that the only reason they planned this trip was to be there on that day at that time. And that was awesome. To be in that sea of humanity and feel that atmosphere and be surrounded by people that love Disney, that love Disney World just as much as you do. I mean, it's, it's giving me goosebumps just thinking about it. And I was just there. This just happened a couple days ago. So that's what I loved the most about that. The show was fine. The show is, is you know, great to watch, great way to start the day. But being around those people, those like-minded people, um, it was awesome. It was awesome. And, and I think at that point I knew, you know, my goal has, had, had been done. I, I, was, I was in the park on the 50th. My feet were planted on the ground. And I was there when it opened. Um, and that was great. The welcome show happens, and then I bumped into some friends, Brendan and Catherine from Detour to Neverland. They have been guests on the show before. Um, They also did a 50th recap episode, so go check their podcast out on that Detour to Neverland. Um, I bumped into them right after the show ended. Um, We were planning on meeting up with them uh, anyway, but it was great that we bumped into each other right then and there, and we ended up just spending the whole day together. It was awesome. I just want to thank them for letting me tag along. Um, We had a blast. We had an absolute blast. So I see them. We link up, and we went to Haunted Mansion. And there was a big group of us, um, some other people that that I had met before, some new people, um, some old friends, all sorts of people in this group, went right to Haunted Mansion, waited about 10 minutes. And the cool thing about this was, they brought out their A-team of cast members for this day and this morning. Everyone was awesome, and the Mansion cast members, they all had like a rose on their lapels, like in honor of a celebration, um, which isn't always on their costumes, but I think having it on this day was very cool. It fit in perfectly with the Haunted Mansion, and it was a great subtle nod to the day. I also love that the pre-show is back, Um, so the stretching room is back, they pack you in there, it's great, and I couldn't think of a better attraction to go on first than this one, since it was an opening day ride, it's one of my favorites, it was a perfect first attraction. Went on that, saw it, walked down to Frontierland. We actually did the Frontierland Shooting Arcade, which has reopened. That, too, was a opening day, uh, I guess you could call it an attraction, an opening day showcase. The best part about Frontierland Shooting Arcade right now is that it's free to play. That's right. You used to have to pay like a dollar and you get 35 shots. Now, absolutely free to play. And boy, am I a good shot. I couldn't miss out there. Um, also it might prevent you from, uh, not missing. Um, but I still like to think that I'm, I'm an excellent shot. So we did that. Cool. Uh, another opening day attraction, like I said, and then the group that I was with, they were all waiting to get into the frontier land trading post. So set up around the park, there were a couple of merchandise locations that had specific, 50th anniversary um, merchandise. And what ended up happening was all of those. And it was the Emporium. It was um, where we were, which was Frontierland Trading Post. It was Big Top uh, uh, Gifts. And I think there was one other. I can't remember. Big Top Souvenirs. I'm sure there was another one. But basically, what ended up happening was you had to get a virtual queue for this. So outside, you would, you know, scan a QR code. Uh, you'd set it all up. You'd do that whole song and dance. And then you'd get a text message, a push notification that said, 
this is your window, um, estimated time, blah, 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 blah. You'd get another text message that said, okay, you can come. And then you would basically, that message would allow you to then go wait in line, wait in the actual line. So it was crazy. The virtual queues like sold out as soon as people got in the parks. Um, but the group that I was with had ones for Frontier Land Trading Post. And the big appeal about Frontier Land Trading Post is this is the home for all of the specific pins, the the special pins, the limited edition pins that they were selling on that day. Um, they were like, hey, you want to come in? I was like, I, I better not. My I, I don't think my wallet can take that. And uh, I'm glad that I did. And that's a win for self-control. Pat on the back for Connor. But they go in. And they're in there for a while. And there's so many people in there. And um, they come out. And everyone in the group, you know, they bought a couple pins here or there. The big thing was there were a couple of, like, celebratory pins. So, like, uh, 50th anniversary, I was there. It doesn't say that, but that's what it's like. But then the real kicker was there were a bunch of opening day attraction pins that they were selling. So it was one for Country Bear Jamboree. It was one for Haunted Mansion. It was one for the Railroad. All that stuff. And and they were very, very cool. Um, so they come out and they're like... Okay, the cast member at the register was ringing us up, and she said that she's already gotten a check uh, uh, for, meaning like people came up, they put all the merch they had down, and the total was $1,300. This was at... 8.15, 8.30. 8.15, 8.30. The park opened at 8. And this cast member had already encountered someone who bought $1,300 of merchandise. The best part is it was $1,300 of just pins. Just trading pins. They didn't buy anything else in that transaction. It was a $1,300 transaction of just pins. They were annual pass holders, so it dropped it down to below a thousand, I believe, but thirteen hundred dollars on just pins. What ended up happening was we figured out that it was basically they were selling like thirty pins, like thirty special edition pins. There were the attraction ones, the special day like the the opening day ones. There were thirty in total. Um, each of them limited edition. You could buy two of everything per person. So what ended up happening was it was a couple and they each bought two full sets. So they had four full sets in total and that came out to $1,300. That happened at 8.30. The park was open until 11 o'clock at night. You know that had to have happened many, many, many more times. I don't know if they're going to resell them. I don't know if they're buying them for other people. I think the winner in the end was the Walt Disney Corporation because, my God, did they make a lot of money. But we also heard things of there was, like, fights in the Emporium. Like, uh, people were clamoring to get certain special edition mugs or cups or whatever, and there was a full-on, like, fist fight. Push, pushing, shoving. Crazy absolutely insane. I've never been a that big of a merch guy when it comes to that. I think I think what happens with that stuff is people don't actually want the merch, they want to win, right? They want to win. They want the limited edition. They want to say I was there, I got this. You didn't. It was limited edition, blah 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 blah. blah. Um so it's not even like they're cherishing the merchandise. They're cherishing the win, the competitive nature of getting the item and securing it. And then, of course, there's also people who are reselling the stuff who are trash bags, absolute trash bags of human beings going into Walt Disney World, acquiring merch, more merch than you need, and then selling it for an incredible markup on eBay online taking it away out of the hands of someone that showed up on that day. Um, if you do that, you can stop listening to this podcast. You're, you're trash. Uh, 
But yeah, Fights in the Emporium, $1,300 pins. Oh boy. At that point, I was like, this is going to be an interesting day. We hung out there for a little bit because we wanted to see the first um, go-round of the brand new cavalcade. And this is called Mickey's Celebration Cavalcade. And it's described at wave at Mickey Mouse and his pals dressed in sparkling new looks. And again, read iridescent. Sparkling new looks as they spread smiles across the park in a procession of music and merriment along the parade route. So we saw the first one that ever occurred, which is awesome. Before this, there was two special messages. There was one special message from Jeff Valet. I think that's how you pronounce it. I asked like nine people. Everyone pronounces his name differently. It's V-A-H-L-E. He's the president of Walt Disney World. And then also we heard another special intro from Melissa Vaquente. Uh, she is the vice president of Magic Kingdom, so she's in charge of the Magic Kingdom. Um, they both said nice things like, you know, 50 years ago when uh, Walt Disney World opened, uh, um, you know, stuff like that. And it was very nice. It was cool. Um, and then the cavalcade came by, and uh, it was cool. It was great. I, I love all of these uh, cavalcades. Uh, they have a new song for this one. I won't sing it. I'll spare you the horror of hearing me sing. But as the kids say, that song slaps. That song slaps, baby. So it's going to be a good one. Highly recommend seeing it. You can see... Uh, Whenever they come around, it's actually in the My Disney Experience app now, so you can see the next time that they're coming. Um, that goes across the board for all cavalcades. Next thing we did was we decided to do another opening day attraction. One of my absolute favorites, one that I've pushed so many people, so many great listeners who listen to this podcast to experience. Some have loved it. Others have found it truly, truly haunting. It will always be one of my favorites. We went into the Country Bear Jamboree, and uh, if you saw my stories on Instagram, you saw that it was packed. I mean, it was a sea of people to get into the theater, and then it was a, a theater that was completely full, and I don't think I have ever been in a completely full Country Bear Jamboree theater. It warmed my heart seeing that that attraction was finally getting the attention that it deserved. What ended up happening, I would assume that the shows for this attraction were, were packed throughout the day. But this specific show, uh, co-host Hank and I always talk about the Disney Dish podcast. One gentleman on there is named Len Testa. He owns a company called Touring Plans. They're, they're great. They have great products. Um, he uh, uh, basically said, let's have a Country Bear Jamboree sing-along. Meet at the Country Bears at this time. We'll all go into the same show and do that. He was like up front saying, thanks for coming, everyone. We just happened upon this. I, I did not know it was happening at this time, but I was glad that I was there because it was a packed theater. People were hooting and hollering, and it was basically a sing-along. Everyone was singing, singing along. It was a fantastic time, and that was that kind of energy I was talking about. I didn't have any goals going to the day, like I said, but experiencing the atmosphere, experiencing the energy. It was awesome. And being in the Country Bears, surrounded by so many people singing along, I mean, brings a smile to my face. It was so, so, so cool. Then I was forced on, I was uh, forced on another opening day attraction, the Teacups. I was asked uh, uh, if I wanted to go on. I guess fine, whatever. I'll be a good sport. I went on. We did not spin. I survived. That's all I have to say about the Teacups. If you know me, you know I love the people mover, and I had to go on that. Um, walked over to Tomorrowland after we got off the teacups, went on the people mover. An interesting thing was that Space Mountain was down at that time, um, so the lights were on in Space Mountain. So I took some pretty cool pictures of Space Mountain, the track, when you're in the people mover, um, and you're in the Space Mountain section when you can hear the trains going by. When we were in there... Uh, because the lights were on, you could see the whole track. So it was, it was really, really, really cool. Um, I think an interesting thing here, the people mover all day was probably the longest wait we, we waited. And we waited 10 to 15 minutes. 
normal wait time for the people mover uh, nowadays especially, so no big deal at all. But when the park is at capacity, because they were sold out of park passes, I was thinking every single ride was going to be over an hour. What was interesting is that was not the case. I remember we walked by Mine Train at one point in the day, and it had a posted 40-minute wait. Now, it was a former cast member who worked on Mine Train. I looked at the line, and I saw where the line ended in the queue, and I can say confidently that that was not a 40-minute wait. It was a 20-minute wait tops. Mine Train, of course, is the most popular attraction in that theme park, but this this was across the board. The wait times were super, super, super low. You could walk on many, many things you typically couldn't. What I think the reasoning behind that was people wanted to be in the park that day, and they just wanted to be in the park. They were doing exactly what I was doing. They were experiencing the day. They were saying They were going in there to say, I got to be there on the 50th in Magic Kingdom, and that's what I got to do. Now, like I said, lines were long for merch, and that's that's fine. You you can always ride Mine Train any day that the park is open, but those merch items, they're only available for a limited time. Same thing with the f- food. There was limited edition food. There was brand new food items, so I get that, that there was, there was big lines for all of that. But the fact that the lines were all short for attractions made it super, super, super pleasant to experience a lot of stuff that I really, really enjoyed. Um, the People Mover being one of them. At this point, um, my friends got their uh, uh, comeback time for for merchandise over at Big Top uh, Souvenirs in Fantasyland. This one had more... Um, they had two pass holder pins you could buy there. Or, I'm sorry, one pass holder exclusive pin and another pin that wasn't av- available elsewhere. And then it had a couple of t-shirts. You could buy some posters, stuff like that. So I was able to tag along with them. I did end up buying one pin there and a cool coffee mug. Um, but that was that. Uh, but that was that was a pretty easy, easy um, period. Uh, 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 I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. The biggest debacle of the day was was food, and the food issue was prevalent everywhere. Basically, what ended up happening was Disney was forcing everyone to mobile order from quick service locations. Most of the places were mobile order only. I think Disney still has a staffing issue, so they don't have enough people to man the registers uh, as they would like. So they were forcing everyone to do mobile ordering. Uh, The problem was the system basically... It's not that it was down, it was accepting food orders and then it wasn't printing the tickets. It wasn't it it like wasn't talking to the restaurant and saying you got to make these food at this time for these people. So, you'd order your food, you'd get to the restaurant, you'd say I'm here, prepare my order. And typically when you're here and they're preparing your order, it might take like 10, 15 minutes whatever. We're sitting there. The line for a uh, uh, mobile order comeback was so long. I'm like, this is weird. I saw another friend and he was like, we've been waiting for our food for an hour and a half. And I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? He's like, we pushed, I'm here, prepare my order an hour and a half ago. And that's when I knew we were in for some trouble. We wanted to go to Cosmic Rays uh, because we wanted to see my boy, Sunny Eclipse, shout out, uh, the goat, and because um, they did have a new food item there. It was a macaroni and cheese burger. It was a burger with macaroni and cheese on it, and then it was the bun is toast covered in uh, like Cheetos crumbles, and I needed that. My God, did I need that. And it's a special, this is in honor of the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World. What do Cheetos and macaroni and cheese on a burger signify about the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World? I don't know, but I know I need to have it. So we order, we get there, we say, I'm here, prepare my food. And um, I knew this was going to take forever. Uh, And it did. It truly did. It took hours. I ended up just canceling my order. I never 
once I heard that people were waiting an hour and a half, I just, I never said, I'm here, prepare my food. I just said, cancel. Canceled. I got a couple pretzels, jalapeno cheese stuff pretzels from Cheshire Cattails for the win. I was content. I was a happy camper. My friends continued to wait and wait and wait. Um, one order uh, uh, in the group that I was hanging out with, they got their food. People who placed the order right after them did not get their food. Another group never got like uh, uh, your food is ready request ever. It, it was chaotic. You could tell it was chaotic everywhere. I think we were all kind of okay with it. Because I think we knew going into this day, there was going to be some chaos involved. Now, this really truly was the only chaotic event of the entire day. Um, I guess it is pretty chaotic because it revolves around food, so that wasn't great. But it wasn't too bad otherwise. I think we were all fine with that fact. Um, Now, it was still ridiculous that that occurred on the 50th anniversary for sure. But it is what it is. Uh, We made other plans. We figured it out. The best part about this is we just hung outside. We found a table outside Cosmic Rays, and we sat there for like a couple hours. And on a day that we knew we were going to be there for a very long time, you need that. You need to just sit and not do anything for a while. Um, So that was great. That was great that we were able to just sit there. Um, uh, uh, It was awesome. Shout out... uh, new people I met, Matt and Alex, Matt and Alex Vlogs, they gave me an extra sandwich that they got. Uh, The pulled barbecue chicken sandwich, I think that was it. It was okay, but it was free. And Matt and Alex are great new friends now because they fed me. So anyways, there's that. Um, That was a huge debacle. Crazy, whatever. Um, At this point, we decided, you know what? We're hearing all this craziness about people in the Emporium and and getting all this merch. When we entered the park, you got a commemorative map. And I posted it on Instagram. It's very cool. It's nice hard stock paper. It's shiny. And these maps were only given out on October 1st at the Magic Kingdom. So very cool commemorative guide map. They're giving them out to everybody. But then also when you left, you got a complimentary poster. A poster that said, you know, I was there all that stuff. We were afraid that people were going to exit the park, get a poster, one of those free posters, come back in, get another poster, and continue, and then they were going to run out of posters. So what we decided to do was, let's exit right now, get one of the posters, go put it in our cars, and then we can go to the Polynesian, and we can hang out there for a little bit. And that's exactly what we did. The best part was, when we were exiting, a little boy went up and said, um, to, to the cast members hanging out post poster and said, is it possible, could I have two posters, one for me and one for my mom over there? And the cast member was like, uh, you can have as many as you want. We, we have so many of these. We have insane numbers of these. So that was good. There was no, there was no way they were going to run out of these posters, which was great. Um, and same thing with the maps. But still, we wanted to be safe. We got our poster. We went, we put it in our car. Sweet. Awesome. Headed to the Polynesian for some AC. Sat at Tambu Lounge. Got, I got a beer. AC, food, drink. That was around 4.30. Then we hopped back on the monorail and we got back into the park around 6. We did one other opening day attraction, Hall of Presidents, which was great. And it's still an awe-inspiring kind of presentation when that curtain comes up and you see all the presidents standing there and they're shaking their heads and nodding and all this. Very cool. Love seeing it. And I also know that it was such a popular attraction when the park opened in 1971. It's kind of cool to see how far the park has come, for sure. We then walked on to Pirates, which was crazy. When I say walked on, I mean, I don't think we stopped until our feet were in the boat. And that's what I'm saying when I I was talking about how the wait times were so low because I think people just wanted to be there. Now, I will say around this time is when uh, uh, we walked back, when we walked out of the park around 4.30, many more people were on Main Street and The Hub uh, than anywhere else in the park. And that was kind of consistent throughout the day. 
you know, crowds weren't too bad to walk around areas from, like the choke point I always talk about, about where you're coming from Liberty Square into uh, fantasy land. I always talk about how that's always a sea of humanity there. It's like your your fish swimming upstream in the wrong direction or something like that. Um, it was a breeze walking through there. The majority of people spent their days on Main Street and in the hub, whether they were just hanging out there, meeting with people. There was Disney executives there. Bob Chapik was there. Uh, uh, Jeff Fillet was there. Josh DeMauro was there. They were all hanging out in the hub talking to guests. The ambassadors were there talking to guests. So that's where all the hubbub was. And starting around 4 o'clock and even sooner than that, people started to camp out. They started to make their space, make room for the fireworks that were happening at 9 o'clock that evening. The first public display of Enchanted. We knew it was going to be insane. We knew it was going to be a nightmare. We also knew that this new show has projection mapping on Main Street. So I wanted to see it for my first time somewhere on Main Street. And I knew today's probably not that day. It's going to be insane. I'm fine waiting. I want to see it a couple times before I give my reviews on it. So what we ended up doing was after we did Pirates, we got some food. We hung out for a little bit. And then we went behind the castle. Behind the castle was always a cool place to watch Happily Ever After. Um, And because there were people camping out in front of the castle, we just decided, you know what? Let's go back behind the castle and watch it there. I will reserve my judgment, like I said, until I see it in person from Main Street like it is intended to be seen from. I think for this particular show, um, with Happily Ever After and even Wishes, you could watch it from behind the castle and it was pretty sweet. I don't think you can do that with this one, which is unfortunate, which is unfortunate. Then after that, um, I walked on to Mine Train, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. And that was super awesome for me because that was the attraction that I worked on back in 2016 when I was a member of the Disney College program. Um, so it kind of came full circle on that day in a lot of ways, and uh, it was great. I hadn't been on it in a while, but, I mean, we walked onto it, which was incredible. And uh, to be on it, to ride it, to have a wave of memories come back to me from when I was a cast member, for me, that was very, very, very special to do on that day, and I'm, I'm very, very, very glad that I did it. Um, at that point, you know, after Enchanted, it was about, uh, it was getting close to 10 o'clock, so we just hung around the hub, uh, talked to some other people, people watched, all that. What they're doing is every, I don't know, it might be like every 15 minutes or so, they're doing this thing, it's called Beacons of Magic. So there's uh, Cinderella Castle, there's Spaceship Earth, there's the Hollywood Tower Hotel, there's the Tree of Life. They're all becoming, what Disney is saying, beacons of magic. And they're basically doing projections, they're doing lighting, um, and it's all throughout the night. But at certain intervals throughout the night, uh, this transformation occurs. So like the projection mapping is taken down, and then this little show happens, and it lasts about 30 seconds. But let me just say, the Beacons of Magic transfer t- transformation on the castle is incredible. It's awesome. It's so bright. It plays with the, the colors on the castle so, so well. I love it. I can't wait to experience the other Beacons of Magic at the other parks. Um, because if they're done if they're done half as well as this one, then they're still going to be incredible. So definitely check that out, the Beacons of Magic stuff. At that point, I felt as if my legs were going to fall off my body. So I said, you know what? It's probably time to call it a day. Got on the ferry boat back to the parking lot at 10.33. So I was in the park starting at 7.20, and I didn't leave until 10.33. It's about 13 hours uh, that I was in the park, um, which is awesome. I didn't think I was going to be there for, for that long, but... It was an exhausting day, but it was a day filled with so many incredible memories. I got to hang out with some awesome friends. I I got to meet new people. I got to experience the magic. Um, I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, 
I posted a bunch of stories to my Instagram, and I, I made a story highlight of them as well. So if you go to my profile, at WDW Opinion, you can check out all of that, all those story highlights. And to wrap up the show, I just want to say thank you all for listening. This day, the 50th anniversary, um, it was a very, very special day for me. Uh, um, there's construction going on behind me now, which is a great time to have construction going on. I'm getting to the sappy point. So if you hear that, that's what's going on. But I do just want to say say thank you all for listening. Um, the 50th was, was so important to me. It was a very special day for me. Uh, but I am so honored and humbled and appreciative that I have people like you who follow along on on my journeys. Um, when I was in Magic Kingdom that day, there were so many other awesome creators, and I couldn't help but think how crazy it is that um, I am a part of this, that you all take time out of your day to listen to this, to follow along, uh, to reach out to me, to say you would like what I'm doing, um, I'm getting a little misty-eyed. Uh, it's awesome. And I can't thank you enough for your support. Um, it really means the world to me. This podcast pushes me out of my comfort zone, and I'm I'm so happy that, that you're able to follow along, that you like what I do. And I'm so honored that I get to share these experiences with you via this podcast. It was an incredible day. It was a great way to celebrate 50 years. But here's to 50 more years of magic because there's a lot more to come from Walt Disney World. There's a lot more to come from WDW Opinion. There's a lot more to come from me. There you go. Great way. Great episode. Construction is really pissing me off behind me. Um, If you enjoyed today's episode and you're on YouTube, be sure to hit the like button. Leave a comment letting me know you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the channel. For those people listening on Apple Podcasts, please be sure to subscribe and rate and review the show on there. I'll be sure to read future reviews on the show as well. If you listen on Spotify, please click the follow button on the show page, as that will help us out too. In between episodes, the best way to talk Disney with me is join the WDW Opinion Years Facebook group. You can connect with your fellow Disney fanatics over there and talk Disney all the time. You can join that group by going to wdwopinion.com slash opinion years. That's O-P-I-N-I-O-N-E-E-R-S. If you like the show, be sure to share it with your Disney World loving friends. That would be awesome if you could do that. And if you are ready to book a vacation to Walt Disney World, if you're ready to celebrate the most magical celebration on Earth at Walt Disney World and you want to be there for its 50th anniversary, then reach out to me at Connor, C-O-N-O-R at WDWOpinion.com and I can help you book a trip because I'm a travel agent with ear to there travel and I'll help you find the best deals, answer any questions you have, book dining reservations for you, and I'll be an advocate for you. Someone you can turn to for advice. The best part about this service is, is that it's 100% free to use. It doesn't cost you a dime. So reach out to me at Connor, C-O-N-O-R, at WDWOpinion.com, and I can help you book a trick, trip. Of course, if there is ever anything I could ever do to help you, I am more than happy to try and do so. Just reach out to me at Connor, C-O-N-O-R at www.opinion.com. If you have any questions or you need anything at all, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, guys, as always, for listening. I really, really, truly appreciate it. That's going to do it for me this week. If you liked what you heard today, then you've been listening to the WDW Opinion Podcast. If, by chance, you didn't like what you heard, then you've been listening to The Problem with John Stewart. I've been Connor Brown. And until next time, keep LTD living the dream, and I'll see you real soon.